It's April 22nd, 1884, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. The impracticable scheme of a visionary was the most charitable verdict Thomas Stevens says he encountered when he first announced his plan to cycle around the world. But according to the man himself, the first essential element of success is to have sufficient confidence in oneself to brave the criticisms, to say nothing of the witticisms of a sceptical public. And so he set off on this day towards the Sierra Nevada mountains and ultimately into the history books. But you made him sound like a kind of... Oscar Wilde type character by that very erudite quote that you kicked us off with. <laughs> Worth mentioning that he was working in a mine when he got the idea of cycling initially across the States before he had the idea of traversing the world. But I mean, how many people working in boring and difficult hard labor jobs like that have dreams like that? And how yeah. few people actually pursue them? And by the way, a bike then in 1884 was a penny farthing. It wasn't a bike like you have now. <laughs> It's something that leaves you four foot off the ground. Uh, Yeah, and according to some accounts, he didn't even know how to ride a bike at the time. Bike riding was a relatively new phenomenon, and if you're working in mills and mines, as he was, there's not really much cause for a bike. Although, side note on the penny farthing, I've always wondered why did they have them? Why didn't they ride normal bikes from the start? Why didn't they realise you don't Mm. need a giant wheel? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's all to do with uh, like the gears on a bike that enable you to go faster. Without mm. gears, the thing that could make you go faster was having a gigantic wheel. If you like, think about like the momentum and drive you'd get from that huge wheel, that was what enabled you to cycle at a fast enough speed to make it fun. I guess if you imagine like cycling on a tiny, tiny wheel, how slowly you'd go. Yeah. <laughs> but the downside of them was that you would inevitably be thrown over the handlebars many times. And that was right. one reason it took a while to pick up. Yeah, so the things that he took with him initially in his handlebar bag were a few clothes, a raincoat and a pocket revolver, and a sort of soft hat. But having been thrown over the handlebars one too many times, he eventually reached for a military helmet, which then became the thing that he wore for the rest of his journey around the world. I did notice no mention of underwear in that list. I think we can probably conclude he was going commando. I think we conclude (laughs) that he stunk. Um, Because you read some accounts of him wheeling into various towns across America as well. And this guy turns up covered in mud and sweating profusely. As much as anything, the physical challenge wasn't even just the bike. It was the sheer mileage, wasn't it? it? It was the fact that he was traversing the country, one third of which he had to walk across the United yeah. States lugging the bike around and then sleeping under the bike so he used the waterproof cover as a tent at night with the penny farthing being the pole in the middle i mean some people now say they can't cycle to work because there's no cycle path on the road (laughs) yeah (laughs) those initial stages were incredibly rough like he had to push his bike through the sierra nevada mountains then it was along wagon trails over scorching desert where he was attacked by a mountain lion he was bitten by a rattlesnake like he really had the worst time at the start his encounter with that mountain lion is amazing actually the lion lunges at him and he actually hides behind the bike and then shoots at him but he says that as opposed to most people who shoot too high he was like in his brain he was going most people shoot too high so I'll shoot a bit too low but he actually did shoot too low but it kicked up dirt into the mountain lion's face and the mountain lion then sort of slunk away into the bushes and ran off but his final comment was I shall shed blood of some sort yet before I leave Nevada there isn't a day I don't shoot at something or other and all I ask of any animal is to come within 200 yards and I will squander a cartridge on him and I never fail to hit the ground (laughs) well of course we know this because ultimately he published a best-selling two-volume book around the world on a bicycle and so we have his account Mm. to go on But a bit like our episode the other day about the uh, first European who returned from Timbuktu. I mean, we only have his account to go on, don't we? The lion didn't write a novel. So, I mean, there's a lot of (laughs) daring do and adventurism, which I think may be slightly fabricated or glamorised. But I mean, Mm. cycling was in need of someone to glamorise it. It was a popular hobby of middle class young men who had the disposable income to buy one and the time to actually learn to ride it. It had a bit of a controversial reputation, mostly because they enabled young people to cycle away from the watchful eyes of their elders. It was particularly concern over the idea of women learning to ride bikes because who knows where they could go in one you know they could just pedal <laughs> off so at every stop along the way 
way, Stevens was greeted not just by curious onlookers, but also local bicycle clubs. They would yes. turn out to greet him and they saw him as this fantastic ambassador of this new pursuit of cycling. Well, as well as being able to write well, he could also really speak very convincingly. And Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who heard Stevens speak at the Massachusetts Bicycle Club, said he seems like Jules Verne telling his own wonderful performances or like a contemporary Sinbad the Sailor. Instead of going around the world with a rifle for the purpose of killing something or with a bundle of tracts in order to convert somebody, this bold youth simply went round the world to see people who were there on it. And I think that really does sum up his trip. You know, he really is just sort of talking to people, hearing their stories, eating lots of things, actually. And picking up a big sack full of money from the Pope Bicycle Company. So what happened is... He was riding a 50-inch black enamelled Columbia standard bicycle with nickel-plated wheels, which was made by the Pope Manufacturing Company of Chicago, heard his story and agreed to sponsor him to carry on and go around the world. So it was about very much uh, communicating that message of travel for travel's Mm. sake and meeting people and experiencing new cultures. But it was advertorial for Pope's Bicycle Company. (laughs) It was quite a modern idea. It was like, well, here's a young man who perfectly exemplifies our get-go spirit. He's managed to get across America. Let's turn this into a giant promotional opportunity and go around the world. He set out from Liverpool in May 1895, cheered on by hundreds of spectators and accompanied by an honour guard of 25 local cyclists. And then went to, we'll do the country list in a moment, but I think it's important to represent Berkhamsted because he was British, he was from Berkhamsted. He went to (laughs) Berkhamsted, shout out for the home counties. (laughs) But then on to (laughs) France, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Slavonia, Serbia, Bulgaria, Rumelia, and finally arrived in Constantinople. But then it gets interesting. Anatolia, Armenia, Kurdistan, Iraq, and all the way to Tehran where he was invited to stay for the winter as a guest in the Shah's palace. Yeah, and actually the Shah then puts him through a few tests, getting him to ride fast and slow, um, and then (laughs) setting him off in the direction of where the Shah definitely knew there was a ditch. (laughs) And he only just manages to get off his bicycle, but he says, that could have broken my bones, and the Shah just laughs at him. But by virtue (laughs) of having then met the Shah, he becomes this massive celebrity, at least according to his own account, in Tehran. And he's soon known by the title of the be Sahib, pretty much it translates to Sir Horse of Iron, <laughs> which I think is great. <laughs> yeah, and actually the curiosity around the bicycle, which obviously in these rural villages had never been seen before, slowed his journey down because every single place he stopped, mm. people wanted a demonstration of how the bike mm. worked. They wanted to look at it, wanted to try it out for themselves. So it took him a long time to get to Russia. And his original plan was to cross Russia in the spring and the summer season but he was denied entry at the border. So he came up with this idea that he would cross Afghanistan, which he'd been warned not to do, and he was quickly arrested. Although, once again, this new novel contraption made him a minor celebrity, and his imprisonment was in a really cushy villa where he was apparently given imported English biscuits. Yeah, but he was still sent back to Constantinople. I mean, he'd had an adventure. He's been humiliated by the Shah (laughs) and nearly had his bike broken. Then he's failed to go through Siberia, failed to go through Afghanistan, had to go back to uh, modern-day Istanbul and then get a boat to India to carry on the journey. So it was a big delay. Um, Then he cycled to Calcutta, boat to China, cycled through China, boat to Japan, which was his favourite, actually. Save the best till last, mm. from his point of view. Good place to cycle a penny farthing, <laughs> apparently. Japan in 1886. So the Odyssey finally came to an end in Yokohama in eastern Japan, where, according to his account, he had cycled about 13,500 miles. This is two and a half years after this day when he started. That's a long time. He didn't stay quiet for long. You'd think you might want to put your feet up for a bit after all of this. But almost immediately, he was commissioned by the New York World, a newspaper at the time, to join the search for the explorer Henry Morton Stanley, who'd been missing in East Africa for about a year and a half. But I'm not surprised. After spending all that time both by himself and mixing with people of different cultures all over the world and travels addictive, going back to some sort of suburban life in America would have been complete anathema, wouldn't it? The funny thing is that that adventurous spirit of his was ultimately his undoing because after he'd gone and found Stanley, he then continued to report for the paper that he was reporting for. And he went on to Russia and then he sailed the rivers of Europe and then he went on to investigate the miracles claimed by Indian ascetics. And he believed them, but his belief in them undermined his career. And as soon as he got back planning to show off his kind of photos of Indian miracles... The whole business was greeted with this deep scepticism and his planned tour of London with Indian photographs that fell through and that was kind of the end of his adventuring career. But then pivoted, you know, like Shirley Temple, (laughs) with whom we started the week. 
had then a, a later <laughs> career that was completely different. He ended up being the manager of the Garrick Theatre in London. <laughs> I, I mean, who would predict that? He married a woman who was the mother of two successful actresses, one of whom's husband was involved with the Garrick Theatre as well. And then, yeah, he just seemed to have fade into relative obscurity. He still wrote occasional articles about his life and his adventures. But he was pretty much lost to history after that. But we brought him back. One wonders how successfully he got on shooting his gun at any actor that came within 200 feet of him. (laughs) Next time. And this track also has some fantastic backing artists on it. The lead guitarist is Ray Parker Jr. of Ghostbusters fame. Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.